Hi, I'm Paul Feig. I'm here on Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. And you know what? I'm going to be alone with Jay Kogan. I don't care what they say, because I love Jay Kogan. And being alone with Jay is better than having Jay at a party, because then I have to share Jay. And I want Jay all to myself. So here I am, alone with Jay Kogan. Don't be alone with Jay, Jay Kogan. Hi, and welcome to Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. I'm your host, Jay Kogan. And today I have an incredible guest. His name is Paul Feig, and I'll tell you a little bit about him in a second. But first, I want to implore you to do something that you don't want to do. You don't want to do it, but you're going to do it anyway, which is subscribe to my damn show. You have to like it or press subscribe or something, especially if you're, if you're on YouTube, subscribe to YouTube. Even if you don't watch it on YouTube, subscribe to it on YouTube. You know why? Because I need a summer house. And my summer house is completely dependent upon how many people subscribe to this show. Right now, producer Ryan has told me we need about, I don't know, 10,000, 11,000 subscribers to, uh, for this show to start making money. And right now we have 30, uh, 31. If you press subscribe and show me a photo of your subscription, I will send you back something very special. And write to me at uh, dbawjk at gmail.com. Show me a little photo of your subscription and I'm gonna send you back something, a photo or a comment or something, a rarity, a rarity from my collection of rarities. Anyway, uh, I would appreciate it. Paul Feig is a guest today. Paul Feig, one of the great directors, comedy directors of our time. And he's a guy who kind of created his look and his life just from an idea that he could, which is fascinating to me. I was kind of born into Los Angeles and show business. He was not, and he sort of found his way here and every step of the way made the right choices. I made mistakes, sure he did, but he got more and more into who he wanted to be and now he is fully realized as Paul Feig. And Paul Feig is only one thing, which is a well-dressed, really nice, pleasant, uh, warm, guy who cares about people and cares about the world. Gee whiz, uh, I would like to be some better version of myself. The question really is, do I just live my life as Jake Hogan or do I, do I think specifically about who I wanna be and work to become that person? Right now I've taken the easy path, which is just go with the flow and be myself, but what would happen if I chose more? What would happen if I was more directed and more careful and more goal oriented into who I became. What do you think? Do you think you could will yourself into becoming something more than you are? Or is it just enough to be the authentic version of you? That's the question. And that's what we'll be talking to Paul about amongst many other things, including growing up in Michigan and being a near alcoholic. Uh, so we'll talk to him about all those things uh, right after this. Don't be alone with Jay, Jay Kogan. I'm gonna, are we recording? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna officially welcome you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is a thrill to have, <laughs> I'm gonna talk to my camera. Hey, uh, oh, I got uh, a camera. Th that's Hi, your camera. camera. Hey, camera that's four. The, yeah, uh, I, I, it's a thrill for me to have an old friend of mine here with me, but he's not, He's not here because he's no friend of mine. He's here because you love his movies. <laughs> so this is Paul Feig, everybody. Hey. hey, welcome, Paul Feig. Thank you, Jay. Paul Samuel Feig. Paul, so yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I demand you use my middle name. <laughs> uh, uh, we've known each other for many, many years. So long. I knew you before you were a famous director. Mm -hmm. I saw one of your earliest films. <laughs> yes. And I believe at the time I said, get out of the business. <laughs> I think you did. Yeah, do, do and not, I foolishly did not listen do to not you. Do not do this anymore. Uh, and <laughs> and, uh, and increasingly, it's interesting as I watch my career, I watch your career mm. grow in steps and bits and pieces from yeah. a really good actor, <laughs> you know, you. really good actor. You don't act <laughs> Limited enough. but fun. No, really good actor <laughs> and you, you don't act enough still. You should act more. <laughs> I wrote you a part you couldn't do on a show we had, but, but I'm, oh. I'm gonna write you again another part. Thank but you. you started writing stuff, mm -hmm. which was great. Yeah. And you know, a little tentatively, but you started writing stuff exactly. and then you started directing stuff and you started making stuff and mm -hmm. like you grew and got better at it, but also there's something hmm. about you yeah. that exudes um, some sort of creative partnership. Oh, okay. I think, I think that, and I mean, and you, this is in form of a question. Yes. What is it 
that makes you so collaborative where hmm. perhaps other people aren't? What is What are you doing that everybody wants to work with you and loves to work with you <laughs> and feels safe working with you? Thanks. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a fan first and foremost, so I really like people and I kind of want to work with them, uh, especially when it comes to actors, but I mean, creative people, right. all that. But I just learned early in my career when I was trying to be a control freak that it was just completely diminishing returns because all I'm doing is cutting off creativity of other people because I have some vision that I think is so great. And, you know, I'm doing comedy. Right. So, you know, you can't do comedy in a vacuum. And, you know, when I would be acting or whatever, when I would try to do stuff, someone get slapped down by somebody or, you know, so just stick to the script or whatever, it was kind of demoralizing. Right. And I just always kind of felt like I've got a lot to give. Now, and you're if talking you talking about Tom Hanks, right? <laughs> Tom Hanks talk, oh my you. God, yeah. oh, Jesus a monster, Christ. a monster. <laughs> Good old right. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I love Tom. I get it a little bit. I mean, do get like, especially you know, you you you're a writer and a director, and yeah. so when you write and what and one of my very favorite movies of all time, not just one of your Spy, oh, is thanks. a great great movie. In <laughs> Thank you. it's 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 a tribute. It's a love note to James Bond, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's its own funny, weird, great world oh thank you man. and uh, i'm you know i'm a huge fan of this movie but oh, but if i wrote this script that i loved i'd want to, them to do right. the script do the words now i don't want to like i said tamp down creativity but eventually i'd like to see at least most of that yeah or a lot of that are, are you know i want to hear it yeah maybe it's not great yeah but i want to hear it and then play if we're in the scene or in the moment yeah, but, no, yeah. I, I and I get that, and yeah. I, I try to do the, that, although I'm not even kind of the guy of like, let's just get one exactly yeah. scripted. It, it's, I, I like when it happens, but the minute somebody starts doing their own voice, you know, I've always just said, it's like, I, I'm not inside their mouth, if you know right. what I mean, which sounds terrible. Right. But because everybody it's says something. It's worse if you are inside yeah, their mouth. Yeah, well, it is. So I the know, way you said it's much better. If they haven't yeah, brushed, exactly. especially. Um, but, you know, so everybody talks differently. Right. So I can construct a joke. I mean, I had this happen when I was working on a, a sitcom, and directing one, and um, basically the showrunner had a joke. He wanted this very unique actor, comedian right. actor mm -hmm. to some, again, I'm not naming names because okay. <laughs> I'm very political. Sure. Um, and so, but that actor had a really funny way of delivering it. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's really funny. And this guy was like, he's got to say it is written. So I had to go in like, okay, can you, let's, you know, try it again mm -hmm. like this, this. And this happened, I mean, this was 15 times, right. 15 takes in. Okay. And suddenly that actor was like, man, this guy's killing me, blah, blah, blah. So suddenly he, he turned on me. Right. And I finally went to the showrunner. He said, like, if you want him to say it, you go in and, right. and, and do a, a line read right. before. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and, and it wasn't right. right. Because when the guy finally did, did it, it wasn't funny because it was written for this one guy's voice and right. into this other person's mouth. Right. The writer, that happens constantly in the writer's room where some writer yeah. says some line mm -hmm. and it's really funny the way the writer says it. Yeah. And then they have written it for this actor who can't say it that way. Yeah. And we're all We've heard it already in the writer's room. Yeah. Done the other way. <laughs> exactly. Like that was, that was so funny. Can we, they do it? And uh, that's just not how it works. No, no. It, it's just you know you got to be really open to stuff. Yeah, you know, it, it'd be one thing if I was like every time they didn't do it right, and I got the editing room was like, oh man, they fucked that all up. Right. But I can't tell you how often somebody delivers something in a way I'm like, oh god, okay, well, let's we got that. Okay, that's great, we got that. I'm always trying to be positive. Right. And I get back to the editing room and it actually turns out to be far better than anything I right, wanted. Right. And then, you know, and sometimes people go like, you know, they'll go like, just give me a line reading. When I do it, it immediately sounds terrible, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, just do it the way you want. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. I, that's always, <laughs> always embarrassing. Do we, well, here's the line reading. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they're like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, I, I mean, you beg to try and find a way to get them motivated into saying it the way you want it to. Yeah. So that they can use the process. Yeah. So well, it's natural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. As a director, I mean, that's, you know, I, 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 you work with all kinds of actors mm. and some people are very just like, just tell me what to do. Tell right. me this. You know, other people who I've worked with, like, you know, I had one actress I worked with who was really amazing. But I remember I, I, my biggest compliment on set is, oh my God, that was so hilarious when you did mm -hmm. that. You know, and most people, com right. com comedian people like that. Right. So I come into her like, oh my God, it's so funny when, when you, when you, smiled at the end right. and she's like oh results results she started yelling results i go like oh and i so i hadn't worked with like a real method person right. before right and i was like oh shit okay so then i had to realize okay i think at the end you know i think you're feeling better about this right. and that gives you some kind of a joy right. okay right. and they got it right. so right right <laughs> so okay. the process yes, yeah. way. Give them and i respect and i respect that because they turn yeah. on a great performance
So, Paul, this podcast is called Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan. Yes. Uh, and, and yet here I am, and yet alone here you with you, are, and I'm very Jake nervous. Hogan. Exactly. And I talk about my issues with, you know, smart and interesting people such as yourself <laughs> who might have uh, a take on the issue. And so my issue this week yes. is about how much of Jake Hogan, how much of myself yeah. should I try to create or recreate mm -hmm. or be responsible for sort of giving my life a, a, a push in one direction or another mm -hmm. or my look or my style or whatever. And how much of it is just, well, you're born this way, you, <laughs> life has hit you in a lot of things and you've been taught through the world to just go and just be your authentic self and right. don't worry about the rest. But Jay, are you talking about branding? A little bit. <laughs> okay. But not some, but branding, but also just like you're a guy who comes from Mount Clemens. Yes. Mm -hmm. Far away from the world of show business, but you mm -hmm. you created yourself in a way that made yourself show busy. Like right. you have become show busy and you have a love of show business. You've had a love of show business forever. I but, truly do. But you've embraced in a way that I don't think I grew up in Los Angeles. I have not embraced show business in kind of the way that you have. Interesting. And not only have you created yourself in terms of as a director, as a writer, that you've grown into many things that you sort of wield yourself forward, but you mm -hmm. have a look. Yeah. You know, you, you've, you've cultivated a look, you've cultivated a style, you've cultivated a brand, you have a brand of booze. You have things <laughs> that are, that are you know, you're, 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 you're developed yourself in a yeah. way that, in a strange way, it's like a, it's like a, um, an alternative universe Cary Grant. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, I like, love that. Okay. A really unattractive Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, he's, you know, he, Archibald Leach was one person. Yeah. And Cary Grant was another person. Yeah. You aren't different people. You're still Paul. Mm hmm but you're a different Paul than I knew 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're definitely much more self-assured. You're definitely, oh. thing. Your, your clothes are different, everything. <laughs> there's a lot about you that's different and I respect it. Thanks. And it and is, how did you come to decide mm. what are the things I want to change and grow about myself and what are the things I'm gonna leave to be good old Paul? Yeah, I mean, interesting, fascinating question, Jay. I am a fascinating guy. <laughs> you really are, yeah. you deserve your own podcast. <laughs> no, wait a minute, right. what's going on? Yeah. It's interesting just even starting from the idea that you grew up here right. and I grew up in Michigan. Right. So you were surrounded by the industry town right. And for me, it was a mystical, magical place that I didn't even think you could have a career in. Right. You know, but I would then see pictures of this mystical, magical place of like Alfred Hitchcock on the set and John Ford on the set and, and you know, all these other directors from the 30s and 40s. Everybody's wearing suits and ties. I mean, look so cool. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, oh, that's what that's what it looks like when you make a movie. That's what that's that's what Hollywood right. is. So when I came out. You know, out here, God, back in an 81 to be a tour guide at Universal right. Studios. I mean, I, I think I just always, I always had a style. I always wanted to have a style. And, and a lot of it was based on things I would see. I think I've spent my whole life wanting to be other people. Yeah. You know, and so the first time I decided I, want, I really should dress up was back when I was like six or seven or eight. I forget what it was. And I'm, Groucho Marx was my hero. And so I read this biography of Groucho that, and it said, Groucho never trusted a man who didn't dress well. <laughs> so that was my first time. Like, oh my God, I got to dress well, you know? And so started getting GQ and right. all these things and, and looking at that and going, like, oh, this, I, I want to be the guy that dresses up now. Right. And it was from watching movies with my mom of, you know, Cary Grant movies and all that stuff, like you said, yeah. and you know, all the, you know, the usual touchstones, Fred Astaire. Sure. And just went, they look really cool. They do. They're classy. They're, uh, they're, they're almost otherworldly yeah. in many ways, but we're living in the real world. Yeah. So, you know, so how much of that do you decide? Well, I, I think I can embrace this percentage of that fantasy and bring it to my, my life. I guess for me, it was kind of this slow realization that I can kind of do whatever I want right. as far as my look. Right. You know, because when I was first kind of starting to direct, it was like, oh, you're, you're down in the dirt and all this stuff. Even though I had that image of directors now, I'd worked, you know, as an actor for so long and saw, you know, they, nobody dressed up really. There were some guys that would kind of wear a nice sweater or whatever, but they, and I was like, oh yeah, because you're down on the ground setting up shots and so you're going to get dirty and all this. And then just one day when I decided I wanted to flip the flip the, the narrative, right. went like, well, I'll get some cheap suits and if I get them dirty, I get them dirty. Right. And it just, and then by wearing those suits, I just, the response that I got was really, 
believe. What nice. was the response? What was that? Response? It was great. Like crew people would come up like, hey, I think it's really great that you dress up like this, you know, and the actors liked it. Did you feel that you got got um, more respect slash authority from the suit? Possibly. Yeah. I, I think what it did is it it focused me as the captain of the ship. Mm -hmm. I mean, my 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 famous quote, right. it's not really famous, but I say it all the time is, I'm the captain of the ship. I want to dress like the captain. If I got on a, on a ship and the captain's wearing sweatpants, mm -hmm. then I'm going to get off the ship because right. I don't trust that captain. Right. You know, so, and it's also such an honor to get to do what I do that I don't want to, I can't show up like, you know, unshaped. I can't roll out of bed. Also, I just can't focus. Like, I need that morning ritual of getting ready, putting on a tie, putting on my suit. And then it just, but it, more than anything, it makes me feel in charge mm -hmm. and just more legitimate. I right. Guess, more okay. Than so you, so part of it is to, give yourself a little authority to your in your own brain like okay yeah I'm, I'm 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 walking the walk i'm talking the talk and then i must be a director because look at me right i'm yeah. the boss <laughs> well my father you know owned an army surplus store which you know uh, which is a, one of the dirtiest kind of stores you can own <laughs> you know was he selling dirt why no, no it's, it's just old tents and and, and, and yeah and, and jumpsuits and things yeah. old fatigues yeah. old you know everything's sticky and old arc, and, and arc 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 surplus surplus yes. i did some research oh my goodness thank you jay but that yeah so so it's a dirty store yeah, yeah and you know and he's in the back the warehouse pulling down boxes and all this stuff but he always wore uh, like a sports jacket, mm -hmm. a tie, and slacks. Always, he had a uniform right. that he would wear. And I was like, oh, I get, and so that was in my head of like, oh, you're, when you're an adult and you work right. as a man, you right. dress up. Okay. So I had that, but if I can go to the, sort of the, the genesis of, I think my current right. self. When we were doing Freaks and Geeks, I just went into this weird thing of like, I'm gonna dress like a high schooler, <laughs> you know? So I grew my hair out long because right. it was that era that we were shooting. Right. And I just would wear jeans and a t-shirt and like an Oxford shirt open over the top. And for some reason that made me feel like I was a teenager, <laughs> even though I never dressed like right. that as a teenager. Right. I was a disco guy back then. Um, so when the show was done and, and I was taking meetings because you know people thought they wanted to work with me, um, I would dress like that and go into these meetings and everybody would be in suits and ties mm -hmm. dressed up and they right. put you on the low couch you know right. the old low yeah, couch yeah. you always pitch on when right. your knees are in your face and i was just like i don't like this dynamic at all uh -huh. because i'm pitching to them and they're kind of like judging me so i go i, I used to dress in suits when right. i was a kid i'm just going to do it again see i just think those executives dream of walking into the, a room with jeans well here's yeah. what happened jay <laughs> yeah. here's what happened right. this is the year 2000 right. yeah uh in the year 2000 yeah so i get these suits and i dress up for my suit i go in somehow in the time between that meeting and then when i decided right. i want to do this yeah. an edict went out saying everybody we're gonna dress like the artists we are tired of being the suits right so it's on i come into this meeting i'm wearing a suit and tie they're all in jeans and t-shirts right you would think they would go like oh my gosh we made a mistake they the, immediately the the mind switch they did was like oh look at this poor sap ah. he put on his sunday best <laughs> right, right. to come to a meeting right. and it's just like but i was like you know what i like the look of this better than i liked right. when i was in before that's the Obviously, the most important thing is how do you feel in your own skin? How do you feel uh, about like Cary Grant felt better being Cary Grant than he did being <laughs> Archibald Leach exactly. for a million reasons. Exactly. But but uh, he didn't like who he was when he was Archibald Leach. He liked Cary Grant and he he strove even well after he needed to be to yeah. be that guy. Yeah, uh, because totally of his comfort that. level. I had something very similar happen. It was like I think it was after Freaks and Geeks. You know, so things were going much better. Yeah, and. For some reason, I went with Lori, my wife, to the to the Beverly Center before the Beverly Center. Lori before Gilbert the Beverly Center was Feig terrible. Is Lori Gilbert one of Feig. the best people in, on the face of the earth. Here, here. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you you have to say that because you're married. Yeah, I don't have to say that. Oh, right. She's just wonderful, and you're married, and she was among the most encouraging people to me when I was first starting out. Too. Oh, that's great. She's just because she's a manager and she knows good comedy and she knows all kinds of stuff. And she's a huge fan of yours and, too. And when she says you're great, she has a voice where you kind of believe it you go oh, yeah. she thinks i'm great i must be great so yeah. i owe her a lot oh i love that yeah, well she's so, such a good yeah. uh spotter of talent yes uh, and, she is yeah yes so we were at the beverly center and i for some reason just went out of the house i was dressing in suit and tie that but for some reason i was just in jeans like a t-shirt i forget why we had to go do something and we're walking around and suddenly i got really depressed and she's like what's wrong i said like I don't like looking like this in public. It reminds me of when I was not, you know, not right. doing well. Right. And and it's weird, like suddenly, so I, I relate to Archibald Leach. Right. So now 
when you see me walking into the room yes. wearing a basically the same thing <laughs> I've worn for the last 50 years. But that's your uniform. <laughs> your jeans or shorts, sort of button down shirt probably and a, and a t-shirt maybe underneath it and some kind of hat. Yeah. That's it. That's all I've been doing for, for forever because I don't, I don't think about it. Right. But it's juvenile. It's well, not, <laughs> it's not, doesn't, it doesn't carry with it any authority. It carries, it's the opposite of authority. Well, it carries fun. <laughs> yeah, it carries with it, oh, this is a fun time, but it's not like I'm gonna give this guy millions of dollars to make my movie. There's a, really, there's a real difference well, between there, that. Well, if you're going to that meeting, yeah. I would suggest putting on a, a jacket. Okay, well, so there you go. <laughs> no, but, but yeah. no, but you have a style. This I always you know say to, to guys in general, especially, is just have a style. Pick right. a style that tells the world who you are, who you right. want the world to think you well, are. I dressed in the uniform of a writer. Yeah. So every writer I knew dressed the way I did, and yeah. that was the uniform. Now, my partner at the time, Wally Walidarski, yes. who I also love, and yeah, no longer greatest. my partner, but hilarious, wonderful guy. Fantastic. He, I would wear this, you know, like a polo shirt and jeans. He would wear, he would look much, much sloppier. Much, much sloppier. He wore different shoes and different socks and like, he dressed a little crazy. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you're gonna make us look ridiculous in this meeting. Oh my God, you're look And people would love him. And that, and he was, came off as an eccentric artist. And right. oh, you know, th th that's just Wally. And there was no, there was never any blowback right. at all from it. So my whole idea of dress with authority or, went way out the window. Well, but it, I guess it's really, it's it's matching his personality mm. so well. You know, I yeah. know Wally so well yeah. too. And, um, you know, cause he's kind of an eccentric, you yeah. know, kind of quirky guy. Right. And it so that adds to it. A little bit of a curmudgeon. I mean, that's the other thing is like, <laughs> like putting on two different shoes is a little bit of like, fuck you authority. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, which I'll is show what you. I didn't want to say in the meetings with the authority. <laughs> like, that, he's, he's just telling you to fuck that's, off. That's the authority, exactly. <laughs> but sometimes they love it because yeah. you know, it's like uh, John Rickles making fun of right. people, they love it. <laughs> right. uh, in Mount Clemens, uh, uh, apparently uh, there's a guy named Peter Taco. <laughs> Pete Toko. <laughs> Pete Toko? Yeah. You did a talent show with him? He was my, my comedy partner. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 You still, uh, Maureen Mullen wants to know if you're still in touch with him. Oh, hello, Maureen. Yeah. Um, every once in a, every few years, uh, yeah. Pete and I will, will he'll he'll either come into LA for something that he's got to do right. or or I'll hear from him. Yeah, we, we don't keep in close contact. But do you have the same sort of comedic touchstones with each other? Uh, we, we did not we didn't. We were kind of both different. I mean, it was a real, uh, 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 honestly, it was like a Jerry Lewis Dean Martin kind Okay. Kind of thing. Nice. He was kind of cooler than All I right, was, right. and I was the goofball. And yeah, we hosted talent shows, and we just kind of did everything together. When you're uh, bringing uh, your comedic eye towards your movies, yes, I mean it's I, it's everything. I know the answer is going to be <laughs> everything, but are you concentrating on the story mm -hmm. first and foremost? Mm -hmm. The where's the funny in the scene first right. and foremost? What? The character, what is the character going through first and foremost, mm -hmm. or is it just everything? Well, I mean, it depends what phase we're in. Mm -hmm. In development, it's it's story and characters first. Right. And I like to develop any comedy script like a drama because I need to make sure that the emotional track of it is right. Because right. first of all, that's what audiences tap into. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I know anybody who's gonna make this thing, that's all they're gonna tap into right. and ask questions about. But you know, that's the thing that gives the actors what to do. And it's just really what pulls us along. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you watch, you know, I love Jacques Tati, but if you watch Mr. Hulot's Holiday, you know, it says right at the beginning, there is no story in this movie. And even though there's hilarious bits in it, it feels like the longest movie you've ever right. seen in your life. It's only every, like an hour and a half. Every single guest comes on and talks about that movie. And Jacques Tati, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, get, I know, enough I'm with so the Jacques Tati, Jesus. Yeah, no, this is, uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you can get, you can get, things can get tiresome. We need to get pulled along sure. and you need to have stakes. And, you know, and the other thing is just there has to be real danger, I, I, I feel. You know, whether it's emotional danger right. or, you know, but those are the stakes. You're talking about you conflict? Like, conflict, yes. Conflict stakes? There you go. Okay, I guess. interesting? I'm with, I'm with you. Hey, I'm with you. I'm with Sid Field. I'm exactly. With, Bring it yeah. on. No, I, I, I say to uh, people who are writing scripts all the time, it's like, what's your story? Yeah. And uh, well, they said, what's the difference between a comedic story and a, and a dramatic, dramatic story? I said, none. Yeah. Absolutely none. Totally. The story itself has to have the same amount of stakes, the same, has to, has to feel important and has to have emotional stakes and the characters need to be growing and all that stuff. And it's just the tone at which you yeah. hit that story is the difference between the comedy yeah. and the drama. And how the characters react to things. You right. know, that's really where I find the most of my favorite funny comes from right. and how extreme the characters are. 
And if you want to get an award. You want to get an award, you probably have to go with the drama. First of all, let's just say, <laughs> chasing awards is the killer of comedy. Right, right. It's, it's taken down a lot of great comedy directors sure, that I love. Sure. Everybody's trying to be legitimate. Mm -hmm. So I, I blame the industry. I, it's, it's right now we're taping this. It's, it's Oscar weekend. That's right. And I just don't like the Oscars, even right. though I'm in the Academy right. and I've, I've directed, you know, promotions for them and all that. Mm -hmm. And I love, you know, I like people in it, but it's just, why is there this competition that makes those of us who really want to entertain an audience generally feel like shit? Right. Well, I mean, ultimately it's a commercial prospect. It's advertising for the movies. Yeah, but it's become so just like, yeah. It wasn't always. I mean, I guess in 19... Oh, it's always been 34 or whenever it started, it wasn't that. It was just like, hey, here's some awards, guys. Yeah, yeah. But it was a luncheon. But this, as soon as it became a uh, a publicity machine, yeah. then that's what it is. Oh, no, totally. Yeah. But it's just, it just, it's, you know, if you really entertain an audience, you know, I mean, it's, it's I mean, the fact that, you know, thank goodness Barbie got nominated for a Best Picture, sure. you know, but, but you know, when everybody was saying it was such a snub against Greta, I'm like, welcome to being a comedy director. We never get lauded. <laughs> right, right. You know, you either get commercial success or you get the awards right. but you know it, there's nothing wrong with awards in, in per se i just think when people start chasing them you know when you, you know I, i'm look i'm speaking as somebody who made this mistake right because right after freaks and geeks the first movie i did legitimate movie was this thing called i am david yeah. which, you know, got sent to me as a book. I was coming off, my mom had just died, so I was kind of in this weird place. And I remember kind of reading this and then pitching to my agent, and he goes, wow, if you did that, you'd be like Steve's alien or something. Right. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, this is my awards play. Mm -hmm. So went into this, you know, sincerely wanted to make it right. good, but at the same time back in my head, like, wow, this is like Oscar right. stuff. And it just, you know, it, it's, I kind of, I, I'm very happy with the movie, but right. it, it's kind of, it didn't scratch any itch that anybody wanted to be scratched right. from me. And I think that's the biggest thing, going back to who's who you are and you know, what your brand is, which sounds gross, right. yeah. is what do people want from you once you've established your voice? Because it's very frustrating. If you watch a movie with your favorite comedy star in it, and oh my God, there they are. And they're playing completely dramatic. It's so frustrating because you're yeah. sitting there going like, I know they're going to be funny. So something, it's coming. They're going to be funny. <laughs> and then they're not. And you're just like, well, why, why did I get that? I, it's like I, Michael Jordan playing baseball. Like nobody wanted to see I that. I guess. But then every now and then you get a Michael Keaton or somebody. You're like, holy shit, he's such a great actor. But he never loses his sense of humor in it. Yeah. That's the thing. I, as opposed to some just go like, I have to drain every ounce of comedy out of right. myself. But if they're, if they're in a drama, but they're still kind of, they, they're not just forcing their face to be still. Right. That's the thing, you yeah. know, you just got to be who bring elements of what people want out of you. You know, unless you're Robert De Niro or whatever and people go or Meryl Streep and go, oh, she's different every time. I think then people that's also thing. actors don't know what people want from them a lot of the time. No, they, well, that's why it's up to us as filmmakers yeah. to do it. Uh, and, and so but and then you can tell, you know someone hey you know what people really like about you yeah. is you know is that madcap crazy things like oh i hate that about myself that's right. the thing that, that's the one thing that they don't want to do yeah but then they can't help doing it well my favorite way to develop for people or when i have a, a, a script that i want to cast is to meet with somebody who's you know known mm -hmm. um whether they are really famous or just kind of people know them and just have lunch or have a drink with them because i just want to see what's funny about them right because it's usually not what they are portraying on the screen if especially if they're like a dramatic actor can you yeah do you yeah oh yeah i mean it was you know i mean Chris Hemsworth, when I had lunch with him, mm -hmm. and just like, God, Chris, you're really funny, you know? And, and, and so I want you to be in Ghostbusters, but I right. don't want you to to use an accent other than your real accent. Right. You know, and Michelle Yeoh, when I mm -hmm. got to know Michelle Yeoh, suddenly like, holy shit, Michelle, you're so you're really funny. So right. I was able to put her in Last Christmas and do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that uh, several, and Statham, you know? I right. mean, just go like, I think you could be really funny just making fun of right. yourself. So back to my original question about creating myself. So if I could recreate myself yes. as somebody else. yeah. Who would guess, it be? I guess I would recreate myself as somebody with more authority mm -hmm. to do stuff, I guess. Right. So that I take myself a little bit more seriously and maybe other people would take me a little bit more seriously. Mm. Maybe. I don't think you need sure to do that. I'm not sure that's so much fun. Doesn't sound like so much fun, but no. maybe. What would you, if you you have 20 more years uh, yeah. to do something, what, what aren't you doing now or what would you like to do that you haven't done or that you think, ah, I now, uh, I'm going to aim at this. Oh, right. Um. 
I mean, I'm in a very lucky position where mm -hmm. I'm actually doing what I love. Right. So and I'm to saying me, that's over. Yeah. I go, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, it ripping could be the, any day now. Trust that me. Away. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I would concentrate on my my uh, my whole cocktail. Thing. Yeah. Because <laughs> I really enjoy that, and I would really love to have a line of clothing. I had one time I had a line of clothing at um, at uh, J Crew. Okay. Paul Feig for J Crew. It was just a limited thing that sold out immediately. It was great. That's fantastic. And then the people who did it all got fired, <laughs> so <laughs> they've never done it again. Because it sold out. Why would they? Get fired? I, you know, they re restructured right, the whole yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. But I really enjoyed that. What made you start? The, the 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 booze is gin yeah my yeah. gin arting stalls brilliant Arting's london dry gin yes i mean there's lots of good gin out there why did you want your own well because I, I love gin i mean it's all i've always my whole one of my whole things about my brand right i don't want to keep saying the gross word brand hey you don't brand yourself <laughs> here don't belong with jake hogan we do not brand ourselves oh no, no, stop branding yeah, stop the branding brand um that i really always wanted to be an adult i hated mm -hmm. being a kid yeah i just hate it. we have that in common Everything I watched, everything I consumed, everything I dressed was all about like, what kind of adult do I want to be? Right. You know, and big, uh, very big um, influence was uh, Darren on Bewitched. Right. <laughs> you know, really com coming home to have uh, uh, not him particularly. He was getting his ass kicked day in and day out. <laughs> but he came by home. Which he was in his mother-in-law. <laughs> you don't want to be. I didn't mind that. I thought was, that. They be even fun. switched him out with two different actors. <laughs> exactly. He's the worst <laughs> icon. The worst role I know, model. I'm, of I'm all actually time. Dick Sargent. So okay, that's okay. I, I, did, I, I couldn't even get Dick right, York. Okay. Like, no, but his wife was beautiful. Sure. And she and there was a, a, a cocktail cart when he'd come in and a martini waiting for and I was like that. That looks great. And so I got really obsessed with, well, being an adult means you drink mar martinis. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I first wanted to do it, like gin was like, oh, because I had a bad experience with gin as a kid, as we all do, you mm -hmm. kind of taste it and you're like, this yeah. smells, smells awful. And so started doing vodka martinis, but then read this cocktail book that was very influential to me. And it said a real martini is not a, a it's always gin. Right. And so I said, well, I got to do that. So right. basically I was like, I got to force myself like gin. So I just kind of taught myself to like gin and in the process fell in love with gin. Right. And, but, but you know, but there's the old gins, the beef eaters and all mm -hmm. that stuff, which are really gin. I mean, mm -hmm. like punch in the face, right. juniper, pine salt. And so I started looking around over the years for ones that were friendlier mm -hmm. and started finding them. I was like, oh, I like this. I like this. But I always knew like, oh, if I could invent my own, I know exactly what I wanted to taste like. Yeah. And so finally was just able to realize that dream. Fantastic. Yeah. The Arting Stall Gin. Yes. Which, um, you know, you just described how you came to it. Mm -hmm. Now, where can one find Arting Stall Gin? Uh, Arting Stall's Brilliant London Dry Gin can be got around the country, but it, we're still not everywhere. Mm -hmm. The best thing to do is go to artingstallsgin.com uh, to look up where we're at. But if you're in California or in LA, you can get it at uh, The Flask and you get it at Remedy Liquors and, uh, and Duvan. Now, and other places. Now, if I wanted to use your gin in, in recipes for yes. gin, how would I do that? Well, Jay, I just happen to have a cocktail book I wrote. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's called Cocktail Time, The Ultimate Guide to Grown-Up Fun. Uh, came out last year. And uh, it's it, I, I did a, during the pandemic, I did a Instagram cocktail show every day at five o'clock for 100 days in a row. Um, and it's really, that was the genesis of the book. All the recipes I did on that show, I put into a book, but then it just started to expand from that. And I started to do essays on how to set up your bar and how to throw a cocktail party and all this. And then lots of doofy stories from my life how associated you, with the drinks. Up until you wrote your book, what was the best cocktail book you'd ever seen? Well, I love the Mr. Boston books, you mm -hmm. know, which are, they don't even make anymore. Right. And I just love them because they're just, it's just simple. Here's the, the, a million recipes. They're all like three or four ingredients. And it's just a fun, if you have, like I do, a, a love of kind of creating cocktails, mm -hmm. you go in there and go like, oh, this one, this is a good base to work off. And right. then you start to change stuff or add to it. And it's really great. So I, I love that. I collect the old ones because they used to come out every year. Yeah. Now you should make the recipes in the book. You should make sure that they only work with Arting Stall gin. Well, exactly. Like, like the, the Trust other, me. Any other gin is poisonous. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Don't even look at the other gin. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So and, and is there any drink in the book named after me? Uh, oh, no, there's oh, not, but God damn it. that's the next book, okay, Jay. Right. Part two. <laughs> the Jay Teeny, okay. exactly. All right. so, uh, so the name of the book again. It's called uh, Cocktail Time, The Ultimate Guide to Grown-Up Fun. Cocktail Time. And you can get it anywhere. And and if you have the gin and the cocktail and the outfit, yeah, and the music, you're me. Oh yeah, there's and the a, music. Every drink has a, it's a song that right. you're supposed to play with it. Right. And and I I, I would watched your uh, 
watched watched you making cocktails over the <laughs> pandemic, and you had costumes. You had costumes for different yes. recipes and things like that. Exactly. And uh, and, and you know, like it was, it was, you were having a lot of fun. It was fun. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, during a time of absolute terror, right? I was like, we, we got to do something, you know. And right. uh, it also was a great way to get dressed every day and not right. spend the day having something to do. Pajamas. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. No, it, we had a great time doing. That's it. fantastic. All right. Well, we are uh, approaching towards the end of our show. Oh, no. there's a, a theme we're going to play the the listener mail theme now it's time for listener mail wow yeah i know that's it's, it's all is, pro this is high end uh the first question is from uh max do you know max pross of gamelon oh I, I love max pross this is from max pross he said uh what pressure do you feel about keeping up with the kids <laughs> culturally i mean do you make a point of uh playing the latest video game or listening to the new olivia rodrigo record <laughs> if only get a sense of what the under 30 crowd is thinking or feeling or like me do you stick to the age appropriate boomer sense of humor that's gotten you this far uh, and you because you're afraid to come off like bob hope when he put up a beetle wig and he act like I got it man or when he rapped with uh, Michael uh, Crawford yes exactly <laughs> um, I musically I try to keep up but mm -hmm. just because I'm always using music in my movies right. and stuff video games I have zero interest in could care less um, I, I'm, I'm not great at keeping up on uh, like current TV shows and that kind of thing and I'm constantly like people are pitching me actors I'm like who's that <laughs> you know but, but then I really want to know them so the biggest thing I've learned in my career, I'll tell you through an anecdote. Okay. Jay. Right. So I was directing on The Office, you know, mm -hmm. for multiple yeah. seasons. And then there was one season where they they made me a, a co-EP. So I said, oh, I want to be in the writer's room too. So sure. So we go into the writer's room and, and I'm sitting there. And, you know, it's kind of a younger, the Mindy Kalings and, mm -hmm. and Lee and Jeans of the world and all that. So I'm probably about 10 to 15 years older than them in general. And so they're pitching a joke and it's going around the table. Everybody's kind of taking their crack at it. I'm sitting there like Cad, the canary go, I'm right. going to rule because this is the exact kind of joke that I'm famous for. Right. And so it comes around to me and I make this joke and it gets nothing. Ah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I just like, I'm the old guy in the right. room that right. pitched the shitty joke. Right. But what I realized then listening and as they went around the room and what they landed on, their joke wasn't necessarily that much different than mine. They just did it in a much more kind of current way. Whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And I can't, can't even tell you what the joke was. I forget. But it's just, so I go like, you just got to they keep... vaping while they told the joke? <laughs> no, what was no, it? no, this okay. is pre-vape. Okay, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. They're burning leaves. Sure. Um, no, I just realized you got to, you need to have um, a collaboration of everybody. So then I'm not the guy going like, don't tell me what's funny. Right. Because the minute you say, don't tell me what's funny, your career's over. No, but I don't, th I don't think you're ever that guy who would insist the old way is funny. It's just like, here's... Comedy is all about just try and fail. Yeah. So try and fail, try and fail, try and fail until you hit it. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, and and uh, and then, like you say, it's a collaboration. So yeah. if that person, that girl has the joke, or that boy has the joke, or whatever it is, then great. Yeah. Or like, hey, and maybe we can augment it with this. Do we like that? Do we don't like that? Like, That's exactly. You know. It's just, yeah. And I always, you know, I've got young people in my in right. my, in my company, and mm -hmm. I'm always kind of like, just read this and make right. sure I don't sound like an old man. Right. In this, and you know, a lot of times they'll flag something. Oh, cool. How would you do it? And that same when I'm on the set, you know, especially right. all the women I direct. You right. Know, I get a joke, and they're like, we even say this. I go, awesome. How would you say it? Let's stop there for a second, because that is something I want to talk to you about. One of the people I, I guess I had on this show a few weeks ago was saying that you were, and, and Bridesmaids and, and particularly Paul Feig movies, were the reasons they thought to go into comedy, this young wow. young actress. Oh, that's so and, cool. Uh, and she said that because your sensibility, the sensibility of Bridesmaids and, and, and the things you do really hit home to her. Hmm. And, oh, that's great. And it's Fascinating to me that you have done such purposely collaborated with women or, you know, mm -hmm. to, because you feel like you can bring to light a lot of, you can help yeah. in that world. Whereas a lot of guys would feel, I guess I couldn't help in that world. I mean, right. but uh, so how do you, A, have the balls to <laughs> be uh, a woman director right. Right, exactly. and, 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 and B, what is it that, that you're that you're doing that, that other people aren't? Well, I'm just more comfortable telling women's stories, I yeah. think. I think all my friends growing up were girls mm -hmm. and, you know, I had so many bullies. So all my friends were either girls or really, you know, feminized guys like right. myself or super nerds, you know, like, like I was back then too. So, I think watching so much comedy over the years, 
and seeing how women's roles were so great, like the 30s and 40s, you know, Rosalind Russell, all mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they pick whatever names you want, um, and then watching it suddenly become women just become props in these movies. Thomas, yeah, yeah, and these guys are all, you know, all you know, trying to get laid and all that stuff, yeah. and I was just like, ugh, I hate this. And then it was really the turning point for me was when I saw, I hate to say this, saw Sarah, Sarah Silverman in School of Rock, which mm -hmm. is a great movie, right? But she just plays this awful mean character, you know. Right. Then Rachel Harris in, in in The Hangover, and I'm like, I know these people; they're really funny. Right. Why are they having to be these bitchy, just right. you know, terrible characters? Right. And I was like, I don't. I want to try to tell stories with three dimensional women characters, and again, just because my that's my comfort zone too, right. and. and you know, the, the key for me is just like, you just collaborate with women because I'm not going and go, all right, here, here it is, ladies. You know, it's like, what do you think of this? How would right. you do this? You know, but there's no difference in my experience between funny women and funny men in terms of what's funny. You wouldn't think. Why is it so like you're the you're the female <laughs> comedy comedian whisperer in that way? I don't know if I am. I think yeah. I'm just I just embrace those projects. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of guys just kind of run from them or they try to you know, make the female characters act more male. I mean, that doesn't make sense, but it, you know, you can't write a female character and a male character the same way. And sometimes you almost go like, oh, did they just like flip like a woman into that role? Right. You know, so, but it's, again, it's just comes from, I can't even tell you how it is. I can't tell you how you do that. All I know is if I, what I write and then I give it to the the actor or, or my producing partners mm -hmm. or the, the women in my office and go like, is this right? What do you think? And they're like, oh, well, we can do this, but we do that. Oh, yeah, that's accurate. And it's and just and then the final thing is just having been most of my friends are women. I'm just kind of more tuned into the way they communicate and right. have fun. When you did Bridesmaids and you work with the a troupe of incredibly yeah. funny women. Unbelievable. And it was really fantastic. But every single one of them got a chance to shine. Yeah. Was that purposeful was oh, that yeah. in the script or was that like you you took the time to say I, we got to give this person their moment and... no i mean we just knew we wanted everybody to have a moment yep. i mean honestly sometimes i watch and go like oh i wish so you know a couple of them had more to mm -hmm. do it, we had more stuff we shot it's right. just you know it's wrangling time. it down yeah. to time but definitely wanted to make sure everybody got showcased right you know because i mean the, the audition process for that was really interesting because we kind of saw everybody in town right and it was really once we kind of narrowed it down to about 24 people we really liked that we would bring bring them all in and okay, you group of three do this, you and just pairing up people up right. and seeing their chemistry. So when you finally found that group, the super group, right. you're like, holy shit, their chemistry is great. Every one of them is different, right. you know. And that was the biggest thing. Like they have to represent a different side of marriage, right? Last thing we do here mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, by the way, thank you for being here. But oh, this is still okay, just so great to see you, just to see you. It's no, great. I love seeing you. Um, so we do something called the moment of joy. A moment of joy. That's the great Charlie Kogan. It is. It is I the was, great Charlie Kogan. I'm sure this has been talked about, but your son is the most talented person I've ever met. Uh, he is uh, an anomaly in our family. Uh, so he's very, he's very talented, adorable. He is uh, doing well at Stanford. He's about to play SpongeBob in SpongeBob the Musical oh over God. up at Fantastic. Stanford. Yes, oh, no, he's, please he's send him my love. I will absolutely. Uh, uh, so. What is something, uh, and I'm going to exclude uh, gin from the conversation <laughs> okay. that, that brings you joy, that, that can sort of like really sort of brighten your heart when when it happens, and something maybe that that you seek out to brighten your great times with friends. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's my favorite thing is like dinner with friends. Yes. You know, it, but you know the friends that you're really close with. Yeah. You know, um, I just look forward to that. I I, I can't ever. Um, not do it if somebody offers something and I got something else. It's like I'll I'll try to get out of the other thing just because it's just I just find it so much fun and it's right. so cathartic and everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I work with so many people and I really love everybody I work with. Right. But sometimes you know you're on a production and you're you know especially when you're off on a location you're like I don't really have any friends here. I've right. just got a lot of people I really like, mm -hmm. but nobody I can kind of confide in and right. stuff. You know, right. So. All right. Well, I mean, that is beautiful. Now I have to credit you. You it said something. You wrote something on Twitter. I you posted something years ago that is one of the rules I live by. In life. Which is what, fellas, keep keep an eye on your ear hair. It's the silent embarrasser. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Listen, <laughs> these babies are clean. I'm telling you, I had to, I clean. I made sure I was cleaned up before I came over. Listen, but it's the greatest. It's the greatest know. advice ever. You get older, hair starts popping up out of weird places. You I'm just don't know. And I've had so many times. I'm kind of like, I look really great, and then like, oh my god, yeah. it's like it's you know been months. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an afro growing out of my uh, uh, ears. So thank yeah. you, Jay, for well, all the many gifts well, you've given me. That's. That's, That's my I, moment of joy I right there. All the time. That I could, <laughs> my ear hair advice has really traveled. Uh, thank you for being here. This is great, and thank I want to thank the uh, the listeners and uh, and audience for watching or listening or whatever you're doing. It's great to have you. Please, uh, if you have any suggestions for me about how I ruined this interview, because <laughs> I'm still figuring this out, uh, write me at dbawjk at gmail dot com. And uh, thanks for not being alone with me. And please. Take the time out of your day to share something with someone. Find a friend and be a friend to somebody and connect with somebody. That's the Listen whole Listen to point. this man. He knows That's what it. he's talking about. That and ear hair. That's All right. right. <laughs> Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Don't be alone.